Greetings, DEF CON. Uh, I'm Dave. And I am here to talk about uh, short lived BGP prefix hijacking. Um, I'm going to uh, probably level with you right up front. I'm kind of terrified of public speaking, and there's an awful lot of you. Uh, the last DEF CON that I was at, there was only about like 20 people. Really, it was me and about 20 other people. Um, so I'm going to try to talk, you know, slowly and not faint, and uh, try not to drop f bombs. And if I do, I'll try to drop the f bombs really quickly. Um, We're doing well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Feels great. All right. Um, so who the hell do I think I am? Um, I'm Dave. Like I said, I think I covered that. I'm Dave. Um, hello. I wrote. Uh, Ah, uh, I thought of that. Um, these actually are slides that are on the interweb. So if you're brave enough to use, um, you know, the Wi-Fi here, uh, you can go to skeptech.org and just sort of follow along. Um, I can't make the fonts bigger, unfortunately. You know what? Good damn point. Control plus. How's that? <laughs> huh. Applause. I'm pumped now. All right, we're good. Um, okay. So I wrote this book. Uh, it's about um, building Nagios infrastructures or something. I don't remember really off the top of my head. But um, you should buy it because I get $4. Um, I write the monitoring column for Login Magazine if you're like a Usenix person. Uh, I actually brought some books with me. They're way over there in that black bag. Um, so you know I'll be handing them out or doing whatever. Uh, right on? So you can find me at those places. If you see me, I'm usually lonely. So come up and talk to me. Um, I'm much better in person, I promise. So, um, really what this talk is about um, is, my, in my opinion, my humble opinion, and we probably have nothing but spammers in the audience anyway, uh, so your opinions don't count. Um, in my opinion, I believe that we are incentivizing spammers to attack the network layer by using things like um, RBLs. Uh, and I'm going to give you basically some historical context around why I think this, uh, and I'm going to then cover um, an attack that I think is really scary um, and that I would like to sort of nip in the bud by hopefully convincing you to stop using RBLs. Um, so this is sort of the context portion of the talk. And what I have here is I have a timeline uh, that starts in 1978 uh, with Gary Thurick. You guys remember Gary Thurick? Does anybody know this story? Gary Thurick, a book to the per first person who can tell me where Gary Thurick worked. There you go. So Gary Thurick was a sales engineer at Digital Equipment Corporation in 1978. Uh, and he had a problem. And his problem was basically that uh, he knew a lot of people on the East Coast. Uh, he knew lots of you know, uh, MIT you know, people. And he knew lots of Cambridge people uh, who were into computers. But he didn't know anybody on the West Coast. and so. What Gary Thurk decided he was going to do uh, was he was going to host a couple, you know, meet and greets basically on the West Coast so that people could come and look at the new DEC PDP-20, the DEC implementation of the PDP-20 at the time. Um, and in order to invite them, he thought it would be neat, uh, you know, and digital and, you know, net aware, uh, if he could email every single person on the West Coast um, who was on ARPANET at the time uh, and tell them, hey, we're going to have this meet and greet, come and see the PDP-20. And needless to say, it, it pissed a lot of people off. Um, it's, it's, it's really funny. It's amusing, actually, because at the time, um, you know, the, the, the send mail interface was like, and this is send space mail, not send mail. Um, you know, it was not very helpful. And so Gary, not wanting to actually do this himself, had his um, secretary manually type in all 600 addresses. And so she, and it's great. You can see this on there. You can go and look. It's, it's hilarious. You, she starts in the subject line. Um, and just, you know, and the subject line buffer is one line long, so then she wraps to, you know, two and then CC, and then you have this big long list of CC addresses. Um, and then that overflows, because the CC address line was, I don't know, like 320 lines or something like that. Uh, and then it actually wraps into the body of the message. It's, it's, it's neat. It's kind of, you know, sort of old school. Anyway, but anyway. 
Um, so the poor woman had to type in all of these addresses manually, and they sent the mail, and it only went to like half the recipients they wanted it to go to because of, obviously most of the addresses were in the message body. Uh, and holy crap, did it generate uh, you know some backlash? And also, um, some other really interesting things happen. Like you have these really neat emails that are coming from like RMS um, Richard Stallman, um, who are saying things like you know. Uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of annoying, but if it has to do with jobs or chicks, you know, send it to me. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, it's out there. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but uh, yeah. So, I, and by the way, all of these dots, I'm not going to spend this much time on. So, uh, 1978, you basically have the world's first spam. Um, so, the period between 1970 to 1994, not a lot is going on. You have a couple right there before the uh, the green card spam, right? Um, and these are not, um, you know, these are like, you know, I love Jesus and uh, can I, you know, get some money for my scholarship, you know, fund or something. I don't remember uh, exactly what the point of that one was. But uh, none of them were commercial and unsolicited until uh, Cantor and Siegel. And the real difference with Cantor and Siegel, Cantor and Siegel is a pair of lawyers. Um, they were eventually disbarred, lawyers who were so despicable that even other lawyers um, decided they were too despicable to be lawyers anymore. Um, and really the weird thing about them that was unprecedented at the time was that they were completely unapologetic about it. Um, when people were spamming Usenet before this, uh, you know, the Usenet community would, would, you know, rear up and say, you know, wow, you're spamming us. And, and people would say, oh my god, I'm sorry, you know, and um, then go away or, you know, learn to be polite. Uh, Cantor and Siegel were really happy with it. I mean, they were like, yeah, backlash. They wrote a book, actually, about the whole thing uh, that sold, like, I think four and a half copies. It's selling a little bit better than my book at, the point, at this point. But um, they, uh, they wrote a book and uh, created a, you know, consulting firm for guerrilla marketing on the Internet. Uh, and like I said, we're eventually disbarred. Um, so between 94 and 95, you sort of, this is like sort of the infant, infantile period of the web. And people um, who sort of have this um, sense for, you know, holy crap, that could make me a lot of money and I have no morals, you know, that type of, you know, sort of intellect was, you know, looking over at Cantor and Siegel and noticing, holy crap, you know, there's actually probably some money to be made here. Um, and at this point you have, you know, you have the actual interweb, so to speak, and you have... Um, lots of people on it already, uh, most of them you know, like Unix shell accounts and stuff, but still, um, you had a, quite, a, quite a few people you could reach uh, with any given message. So by 95 you have, and this is just one year later, you have the first commercial uh, for sale um, spamware, basically, um, for all intents and purposes. It's like a Perl script or something, but it's, you know, it's being commercially sold as you know, uh, software. And along with it, uh, an email address list of one million people um, that you can, you know, reach, supposedly. And al also in this time, um, you have these sort of weird agencies called the Freedom Knights, and uh, there's a, an acronym there that I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but so, like, there's these trade groups that are coming up um, that are saying, you know, let's legitimize this as a business strategy and blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's a lot of uh, argument going back and forth, and a lot of it is really um, neat and naive and, and cool. It's you know, it's it's like the it's like people you know who nowadays would be like you know shoot them, you know just shoot them, public hangings, right? Um, the, it's like these people, but they're sort of on the other side. They're like, well, censorship and you know, blah blah blah, and this is probably not a good idea. Um, some of you who are older might remember Cancel Moose. Uh, Cancel Moose was a guy like somewhere in the Netherlands. Uh, who was one of the very first people who could cancel UDP postings, kind of at will? Um, and he, you know, also he, it was he was he had this sort of enigmatic, you know. Um, I guess a lot of you, you know, will probably relate to this. He had, you know, like the code name Council Moose, and no one knew who he was. And he was, you know, like this shadowy, enigmatic character. And um, he generated a lot of discussion around this time about, you know, just what is, you know, just what is a netizen's right around uh, not receiving someone else's email. Um, so at this point, basically in my timeline, um, I have a split. And what I'm doing here is I'm, and you could disagree with this if you want, and you'd probably be, you know, you probably have a valid point. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm separating um, the anti-spam right solutions into two basic groups. Um, and the one on the top, the green dots, uh, is 
uh, content filters, right? So like this, this is you know various forms of content filter that have sort of evolved around you know um, over the years. Uh, down here at the bottom, I have what I call delivery countermeasures, um, and these, these are uh, solutions that are based on basically taking some indi in, you know uh, some in, you know blah, indicator, right? It's IP address or you know email address of sender or you know um, just some token, right, in the email, and we're going to use that this singular token, and we're going to block the message. So, and in the center, I have what the spammers are doing. Uh, so you can sort of see, you know, like right off the top of your head, uh, what's happening down here is we have kind of an arms race going on with uh, the delivery countermeasures. Uh, you start off with cancel moose, uh, then you start going into like, you know, um, static uh, IP and static, you know, from address filters, which cause Joe job attacks, which, you know, beget RBL, which, you know, causes, you know, whatever. Open relays, there you go. Uh, you know, and it's sort of just sort of kind of you know bouncing back and forth between you know spammer and anti-spammer. Um, this goes on for well about 20 years at this point. This has been going on this sort of delivery countermeasure war, and you you sort of you start off and um, I'm, I'm assuming most of you guys know like when I say gray listing, right? Like um, we're you know I, I see head not, heads nodding. So uh, when I say RBL, basically just a blacklist of IP addresses. Um, that you know somebody else is doing. Uh, here you have uh, this is around 1999. Here you have uh, e-stamps and hash cash, uh, and these are right, like uh, e-stamps e is a micropayment system, right? So like every email you send has basically a check at the bottom of it, a PayPal check, or you know use third-party verification of your choice type provider thing. Uh, and so you send me mail, and the mail has this little check at the bottom of it. And if I want your mail, I don't cash the check. Right, and it's like a check for two cents or whatever it is. But if you know I didn't want your mail and I think you're mean, uh, then I cash the check, <sighs> which even now seems sort of kind of silly. Um, hash cash was uh, sort of the same idea, right? So we're going to take uh, this, we're going to make a micropayment system, but instead of charging money, we're going to charge CPU cycles. Uh, so when you send me a mail, I'm going to give you you know some marginally difficult value to factor, and then you factor it. Uh, to prove that you're who you say you are, and the idea is that uh, spammers basically aren't going to waste the time factoring. Um, they have too much spam to send. Uh, so then, uh, 2000, we start getting into legal stuff. We're going to, you know, sue the spammers, and uh, you know, we're going to sue the ISPs who aren't blocking port 25 from their customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, round about 2002, in the delivery countermeasures war, you have a paper from Paul Vixi. Uh, who wrote Vixie Cron and a bunch of other stuff. He's a big guy. Um, he writes a paper that's called Repudi Repudiating Mail From. Usually I can pronounce that. Uh, and the paper is basically about, hey, we're going to take DNS and we're going to make it into um, this authentication mechanism, right? So now when you send me an email, I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask your DNS server, hey, DNS server, uh, where should this person be sending mail from? And if your DNS server says that it's, you know, uh, someplace other than where you're actually sending it to me from, then I block your mail. Um, this was then adopted, this, this idea was then adopted by AOL, Microsoft, and it's now called SPF, Sender Permitted From. Uh, it goes under a couple of the names that I can't recall off the top of my head. There's an awful lot of you out there. Um, and uh, it's really, really popular among, uh, well, uh, second most popular, like second largest adopter, and this is from a, uh, um, Damn, I can't remember the name of the company. Um, the guy where John Graham Cummings, or the company where John Graham Cummings works. A book to the person who knows where John Graham Cummings works. No, it's like uh, Sophos. There you go. Sophos. Um, so Sophos comes out with a paper like a month ago, and they actually have a, uh, um, like a list of um, who is implementing SPF procedurally within their you know, organizations. And uh, the second, you know, second favorite, right? The, the second top implementer was like, you know, corporate or you know, really corporate companies, uh, like the American Expresses and the Bank of Americas of the world. Um, can anybody guess who the first most popular, like, who SPF is for a book? What? Shout it out there. No. Spammers. Spammers love SPF. 
Uh, because basically, I mean, an entire cottage industry at this point has grown up around registering lots of domain names, right? Um, so you have, like, you know, Domain Guard and, you know, like all these companies that will actually just generate on the fly, like, 200, you know, domain names, random, you know, guaranteed, never generated before, you know, names for you, uh, you know, and, and you, uh, you know, publish, an, you know, a reverse lookup record for these and you say, you know, I'm, that makes me legitimate, you know, like, yay, I can send to AOL users now. So SPF is, um, really, really popular among experiments. I love this idea. I think it's just great. Um, so, uh, SPF sort of, uh, a lot of people are still using it actually, but, nah, you know, um, not working so well. Um, so at this point, um, in the delivery counter, in the delivery countermeasures game, we've sort of reverted back to RBLs, and now we have like this preponderance of them. I mean, they're like, there's like 20,000 RBLs and, you know, uh, regional, uh, specific, you know, with, you know, dot, co.uk addresses and things like this and um, literally just thousands of them. 20,000 may be an exaggeration there. I'm prone to hyperbole. I should have mentioned that too. Um, so by contrast, if you look up here into the um, content filtering section, uh, what you see is uh, the very first content filters were probably uh, Nancy McCullough's proc mail facts, somewhere around there, um, sort of mid-1994, right? Um, where people are just sort of using, you know, static, static string filters in proc mail. And that sort of continues until you hit, like, spam assassin. And spam assassin is basically okay. And uh, there are arguments you can make either way, spam assassin being a content delivery measure or a, um, you know, content filter. But, uh, basically the idea behind spam assassin was we're gonna, you know, you know, I'm not gonna bother. Uh, then you have, uh, 1999, you have another paper from Paul Vixie. This is actually the first paper. Um, SPF came later, but Paul Vixie wrote a paper, um, which basically said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of these emails, uh, we're going to make a fuzzy hash sum of them, um, and then we're going to keep a global database of fuzzy hash sums. And then every mail you get, uh, you can just, you know, you can generate the hash sum yourself and you compare it to the database and, uh, if it's spam, you block it. Um, and uh, this worked pretty well. There, there are two implementations that I'm aware of that people are using a lot right now, and that's uh, the distributed checksum and clearinghouse and Vipel's Razor. Um, and Vipel's Razor, the former or the latter, has been uh, included into a lot of commercial products as well. Uh, so the idea there um, was, I think, a good idea. It's, and, and a lot of people are still using it. Um, it's gotten it doesn't deal very well with um, random strings. Like if you can break the fuzzy, fuzzy hash sum enough um, so that it's, you know, a little too fuzzy, uh, then you get mail passed. And the other weakness it has is um, despite the fact that there is sort of a nascent, um, uh, rep you know, uh, reputation system around, you know, who gets to send mail into what's the, you know, spam database, um, there's definitely some, some database poisoning going on there. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of reducing the effectiveness of, of it over time, in my opinion. And this, by the way, um, I'm not the CEO of anything. Um, I, like, mow my own lawn. Um, I have a job, uh, probably a lot like you guys, um, like a systems administrator for um, a web hosting company. So most of this is um, based on my experience, the experience of people I talk to at universities, um, and, you know, just various research I've done. I published a paper at uh, Usenix, uh, in 2004 at Lisa, uh, which basically outlines um, some implementation work we did. So if you want to check up on me, uh, there you go. Um, so then finally, uh, in 2002, um, we have uh, my friend and yours, uh, what the hell is that guy's name again? Who wrote a plan for spam for a book? Paul Graham. Paul Graham. <laughs> you can come get that whenever you want. I'll just put it here. All right, Paul Graham. Um, can't believe I didn't remember his name. Anyway, I'm running out of books. I better start remembering shit. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so Paul Graham writes a plan for spam, and poof, we have Bayesian, um, naive Bayesian classifiers. Um, and this turns out to be a pretty darn good idea. And this is... Uh, now it's 2007, I believe, um, and we're, you know, we basically have a category killer for content filters now. You don't see, and when I say that, what I mean is um, there are better ways to do artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? I mean, there are like, you know, vector-based algorithms, there's, um, you know, expert systems, there's, I mean, this is, you know, a, a pretty old, um, you know, uh, science, right? 
uh, people in 1968 were using, you know, uh, Bayesian learning to prove that their algorithms were superior, right? I mean, it's kind of like if you're, <laughs> if you're like the artificial intelligence scientist guy uh, and you want to show everyone in the world uh, that your, your, your learning algorithm is good, uh, the first thing you do is you make sure that it can beat a Bayesian learning algorithm. It's kind of, you know, sort of the, the thing that to, it's the bar to cross, right? Um, but what you don't see is you don't see a lot of fancy machine learning um, coming into spam filtration. And some of it is because it's not applicable and others, uh, others of it are because um, Bayesian classifiers work really well. I mean, they really, really do. And, and since, uh, you know, since that initial essay, we've had um, a couple right, refinements on the, um, the technique we've had uh, you know, chi-square, and you have Markov, you know, discriminators, and you have, you know, a couple different algorithms. You have some, um, some uh, data cleaning, you know, type, the Zadarsky paper on uh, noise reduction, Bayesian noise reduction. But you don't have a naive Bayesian classifier replacement, right, at this point. Um, and the, the little secret, and despite a lot of really smart people who should know better standing up at conferences and saying that Bayesian is dead, um, the dirty little secret of naive Bayesian classifiers is they've been here for five years. Um, they haven't been beaten yet. There's no answer to them yet on the spammer side, as far as I can tell. Um, and most of the problems that people have with them um, are implementation problems. So um, we as a sysadmin community, I think, uh, need to look at them a lot more closely. Um, and when I, say, when I say NBC, I'm not talking about Spam Assassin. Um, if you are thinking to yourself, well, I use Spam Assassin, this guy is full of shit, it's Bayesian classifier isn't that great. That's true. Spam Assassin's Bayesian classifier is not that great. Uh, but there are really, really rigorous implementations out there that I urge you to try. Boga filter, CRM114, and DSpam. Any one of those. Anyway, let's get to the fun part. Um, so I guess I think you know, I pretty much covered the conclusions. Uh, I, I don't think delivery countermeasures are working for us. And um, that's just a little, you know, something I picked up on the 10 years that they haven't been working. So I'm thinking maybe we should, you know, not use them anymore. Um, and this is kind of why. Um, we have some evidence um, that Spammers are actually starting to use short-lived BGP prefix hijacking to get their mail delivered. Um, and I'm, maybe some of you know what it is, and for those of you who do, I don't know why all of you showed up anyway, I and mean, there were better talks to go to. So I'm just going to tell you what it is. Um, so you have BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, is basically the uh, internet protocol of choice for backbone providers to talk to each other and tell each other where a given IP prefix is. So if I'm the owner of you know, 64.000 forward slash eight, uh, and I want you to know where it is, I'm probably speaking, excuse me, BGP to you. Um, it's a, it's a uh, transport layer protocol, so it's actually, you know, they speak TCP, and it's, um, it's a uh, vector path protocol, which means that uh, when I say to you, uh, hey, other router, um, I, ha I know this prefix, and here's how you get to it. Um, that router will actually pass the entire path, okay? Um, so, uh, and this, this whole thing, and the path itself is made up of a combination of AS paths, and AS is are shorthand for autonomous systems. So you have, um, if you can imagine, 20, 22,000 people on the internet, somewhere thereabouts, a couple months ago anyway. Um, not people, organizations that run the internet. So if you imagine the internet as sort of this uh, cooperative entity between a lot of private networks, uh, you have about 22,000 private networks. And you have a couple different types of people there. You have level tier one providers, excuse me, uh, like the level threes and the sprints of the world. Uh, you have the tier two providers who are what most people deal with as an ISP, like the AOLs and the MSNs. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of, you know, university networks and things of that nature. Um, and the, the thing about BGP is you would think, um, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't think Dan Greer's talking here, but, um, you know, that whole biological diversity thing where, you know, like everybody connects to everybody else and it's all redundant and, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. Uh, you would think that there would be a lot of redundant paths everywhere. And in fact, there are. But the problem is um, there's an economic layer there too, right? So we're not just talking about um, a routing protocol and, hey, uh, if I can get to 64000 from your router, um, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to send you my packets. Um, there's 
the concept of this layered, right, like ISP structure where you have these tier ones, and tier ones are really, really big. Like level three owns their own transatlantic cable big. I think they own two of their own transatlantic cables. That's how big they are. Um, and so if you're as big as level three, level three will peer with you. And if you get level three to peer with you, that means that you don't have to pay them uh, for transport on their network anymore, okay? Um, and then so AOL pays level three. So that means that uh, this is a transport uh, um, relationship. Thank you. You don't get a book though. Um, <laughs> I'm saving that one. I got some math coming up, I think. I mean, I probably, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, when you think about it, if I am independently connected to two tier ones, let's say I'm independently connected to like, you know, M MCI and I'm connected to level three. Uh, and MCI has a packet that is destined for a level three network. They could route through me, except um, I'm paying them for transport, so I'm not going to be advertising that net block, right? Um, it's just the economics of the situation, and this is called um, zero valley routing uh, policy, right? Um, so what you have is a lot of interconnected hosts, but most of them, uh, first they prefer, they, they prefer a customer network, then they prefer a peer, then they prefer, um, you know, sort of any path they can find. Uh, but that's really important, and it'll become more important later. So BGP prefix hijacks happen when I am not the owner of 64000 and I advertise it to you, okay? And so uh, what this does is BGP, not an authenticated protocol. And there are some, you know, there's an IETF, IETF working group out there working on it. Um, there are various standards, all of them requiring PKI. So what are the odds of any of them actually coming into play any time in this century? Um, so what you have is this unauthenticated networking protocol, right? So anybody can just pop up and say, hey, I'm 0000, send me your traffic. Um, and I actually had a really scary conversation with uh, someone at Usenix, Seco6, who told me that uh, a great number of governments, including our own, find this, what was the word, useful. Um, so this isn't a new attack. It's been going on for a long time. There are, there are you know, um, papers going back decades on it. Um, in the past, like, you know, the slide says, uh, people used it just basically to, you know, sell IPs to other people, which is, you know, technically something you can't do. Um, what, what could you do with it, right? So the, these ones, and there are three different types. Um, well, there's a bunch of different types. So I'm going to cover three of them. Uh, there's the, you know, just normal prefix hijack where you have a prefix and I advertise exactly it. Uh, there's a sub, uh, subdomain prefix hijack, sub prefix hijack, something like that. The word sub is somehow involved, is my point. Um, and they, uh, you basically, because the way BGP works is um, less or more specific uh, advertisements work uh, or, or overwrite less specific ones uh, unless you have um, like filters in place. Usually people filter at the 24 level. So if you have smaller than a 24 net block, no one's going to pay attention to you. Um, but if you're a 24 network and you're advertising a net block that's the same, that's in, that's in you know, someone else's 16 block, you're going to win, okay? Um, so if you think about it, uh, I as a spammer, since I don't really care, right, about your net block at all, I could just, if you have a, if you have, you know, like a 24, I could advertise the eight on your 24, uh, and you would win for everything that matters to you. You would never notice, right? Um, so like the spammer is just, you know, sort of up there grabbing addresses, uh, and some of the traffic is working and some of it isn't, and the, the stuff that isn't is the stuff that you've allocated, right? Um, which is, you know, sneaky and underhanded. That's why I like it. Um, so what could you do with this? You could do all of those other, you could do all those acronyms at the bottom of that slide. Um, it's fun stuff. Um, the, the internet in general is still a small network, right? You have like 22,000 hosts out there. So the, um, the time it takes to converge uh, a BGP advertisement is really highly dependent on where you are in the network and who you're peered to. Um, if you're multi-homed, it takes longer. If you're just a single, you know, uh, customer of a uh, tier one, uh, you could get, you know, a, a propagation out there in two, three minutes. Um, it's, you know, it's fast stuff. So, I mean, you could, uh, for example, uh, BGP, you know, advertise a net block, um, you know, DOS the RIA or whatever it is you wanted to do and give back the IP addresses and, you know, be gone. And no one would have any way really to know where you were or where you were when you did it. So, um, this is all boring router stuff. Uh, 
sort of helping you visualize what's going on here. So C and D are my, you know, tier one providers, and I have AS42, who's my happy OS, or happy AS, excuse me, and he's, uh, you know, advertising this NetBlock 24, uh, and then you have the evil router that comes along uh, up here, AS666, and he advertises, um, right, the same NetBlock, and these are the routers he fools, right? So um, they're actually... A bunch of different ways to, I mean, this is, this is really kind of um, dumbing it down. Uh, there are a lot of ways to influence BGP decisions, um, and a lot of people who are actually trying to do mathematical models to figure out who would uh, be, you know, um, fooled in the event of a, of a, of a large-scale PGP or BGP um, hijack uh, are having to say things like, well, we're just going to assume, you know, randomly uh, in, in, the, in the absence of, you know, shorter, shortest path and, you know, the rest of the indicators. We're just going to, you know, generate a random number and, you know, hope for the best. So um, it's kind of up in the air. The other thing about BGP is uh, different, uh, other thing about any routing protocol at all is that uh, different providers have implemented it differently in their systems. So you have Cisco with, you know, these BGP characteristics and you have uh, Nortel with those, and it's kind of hard to predict what's actually going to happen, is my point. You can stop me if I go off on a big tangent like that again. Um, okay, so that last one, we're basically assuming that, you know, uh, AS666 is evil and it wants our, you know, uh, net address, but that isn't necessarily true for the case of the spammer, right? The spammer doesn't care what IP address he uses. He doesn't want yours. He doesn't give a shit. Um, he basically just wants some IPs, right, that aren't listed on RBLs, and your IPs probably aren't listed on RBLs. Well, hope, yeah, yeah, um, never mind. Uh, so maybe, yeah, definitely doesn't want your IPs. Um, so now we have AS66 and we, mo we moved it down to the side here and we, basically what we're showing here is that if, if 666 moves itself around in the network, um, he can influence who he um, traps. And this is, you know, uh, this is a very specific example and this is, you know, based on path. Um, but there is a mathematical model here, and um, actually Mohit Ladd at uh, UCLA has a paper called Understanding, I don't know, has Understanding in the title, and then like BGP, uh, and something else, good paper, you should read it. Uh, Google Mohit Ladd, it's out there. Uh, but basically they've, you know, they actually have a mathematical model that describes how um, resilient a given system would be in the case of a uh, BGP attack, and what they found was um, that if you are a, uh, direct customer to more than one um, uh, top tier ISP, then you can do a lot of damage and you're highly resilient against other people's damage. So that's, if you want to be, you know, taking over other people's networks, that's where you want to be. You want to be multi-homed to uh, one or more tier one providers. Um, so that's, you know, if AS666 wants, you know, more people to believe him. The problem is um, that AS666 uh, you know, really doesn't have to use anybody's IPs, right? Like, you know, he doesn't want yours, he doesn't want mine, why would he want anyone's at all? He could just use unallocated space, space that the internet registries haven't allocated yet, right? Um, and everybody knows uh, not a lot of that space uh, left, right? So, yes, read XQCD. I kind of love this webcomic. Um, so what this is, is this is a map of the internet using a... Uh, a fractal called the Heimdall fractal, and it, what it does is it preserves uh, block space, uh, continuous blocks of address space, right? Um, and it is a fractal, like you could zoom in on it and hit, it would, you know, become all fractally, you know, what fractals do, you know, it's infinitely recursive or whatever. Um, but obviously you can't do that here because it's just a JPEG. Um, but what we're seeing here is we're seeing all the um, class A networks, we're seeing all, you know, the, the eight networks in the entire internet. Uh, and, the, and we're seeing, you know, who is assigned to each one. So, you know, here's two, two class A networks that are assigned to uh, that organization, DI5A. the hell? DISA. Thank you. Anyway, so here's the math problem. And I, I, me I meant to do this on the board, uh, or I meant to do this, I'm sorry, on the plane on the way over. Um, but that's a long story. So, uh, and I do this, oops, I do this every once in a while. Um, we can take one, well, okay, imagine for a second, we have a thousand spammers. Uh, so, and each spammer wants to use a single IP address a day uh, for a year, and they never want to use the same address twice, right? So you have 364 days in a year, you have a thousand spammers, you have 364,000 addresses, right? Um, each one of these blocks in green is a, an address space of uh, two to the 24 IP addresses, right? 
Um, so a book to the first person who can divide, uh, you know, two to the twenty-four by three hundred and sixty-five thousand and tell me how many years a spam one thousand spammers get out of a single net block. Um, it's not a happy number. It's like a lot. I have no idea what the answer is. So <laughs> somebody else uh, like verify them or something. That was a bad question to ask at DEF CON. Sorry. Forty-two. That's a good answer. I'll take that over the real answer anyway. Um, so 365,000, yeah. Well, excellent. So close to 42. Sorry, I already gave the way the book. I'd kind of be an asshole if I took it back. Um, so there you go. Uh, you have a good 40 years, basically, that a spammer, that a thousand spammers could use uh, basically one of these squares. And there are quite a few of these squares, right? Um, and, you know, there's some hyperbole there, but there's not a lot. I mean, there, there are net blocks in there that are, you know, RFC 1911 net blocks that you can't use and never, no one will route for you. Uh, but the basic premise is, um, you know, any given spammer really could just start uh, doing whatever the hell they wanted with the IP, uh, IP address space, um, and there's not a lot we can do about it. And I've I've talked with um, a lot of the level, lo a lot of the you know the top tiers at like Nanog conferences and stuff, and they're not even considering this to be an attack yet. Um, they're considering this to be misconfiguration. Um, and if it's lasting for 15 minutes, they don't care. Um, you know, it was a temporary misconfiguration. <laughs> Uh, it, well, that's that's you know that's best case. They're 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 considering a misconfiguration in the best case. Worst case is, uh, hey, that's one more path to route uh, you know stuff to. Um, that was actually a, a response I got from someone was, well, you know, hey, if I have multiple paths, better for me. I'm an ISP. Um, so yeah. So. Uh, spammers are doing this now, um, and this is basically how I know they're doing it now. Um, this is out of a paper, shamelessly stolen from a paper by uh, Nick Feimster out of Georgia Tech. Um, and what you're seeing here is Georgia Tech has a spam sinkhole, um, right? It's a three-letter domain, and they just let it sit there and collect spam. No valid mail comes to the system. Um, so what they're doing is uh, they're getting the spam, and they're doing, you know, lots of uh, text parsing on it to just to see what kind of stuff is happening. Eventually one of them got the bright idea, hey, uh, let's take our logs of, you know, what IP addresses we got spam from, let's correlate them uh, with the BGP prefix origin changes and we'll see if there's any correlation between, um, you know, an origin change, us getting a spam and the origin changing back. And so uh, this is sort of the zoomed in version, and this is sort of the zoomed out version. And what you see is origin change, spam, 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 origin change back. Um, so I mean, that's like taking a freaking snapshot. I mean, you can't really get a lot closer than that. It's, it's happening, right? Um, and they actually quantify this, and it's not happening an awful lot. Um, but as we saw in the um, time, uh, you know, don't make me show you the, uh, right, the time thing again. Uh, stuff in Spammerville happens very quickly, right? So when one spammer catches on that another spammer is getting his mail delivered this way, uh, lots of other spammers are going to eventually start doing it. It's not a threat, it's a promise. So how do you pull this off, spammers? Um, how easy is it? Um, how, you know, what do I have to be? Where do I have to be, et cetera? Um, it's actually surprisingly easy to pull off. Um, you have to have some cash to be to do some real damage, right? Because you have to get right underneath a tier one and it's better if you're multi-homed. Um, but you can, you know, like, like the slide says, use a shady ISP, be a shady ISP, or work at a shady ISP. And there's also a lot of social engineering that you can do um, at that level, you know, like, hey, I think you're filtering my announcements, like, you know, especially if you're multi-homed. And if you're a relatively large network and you're multi-homed, um, they're just going to believe what you say, right? Like, hey, I have a path to, you know, 65, 80, whatever, right? Um, and they're not even really, I mean, if you're like COVAD, they're not going to question you. Um, so you'd be like, Kovar, and then like, you know, I don't know, whatever. Use your imagination. Um, so, and they're really not focused on this attack at all. I mean, they're, they're very much of the opinion that um, nobody's doing it and we don't care. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to get in there. I've heard rumors, and that's in America, um, <laughs> going into other countries it becomes, you know, an awful lot easier. Uh, and it sort of depends then on, you know, how much damage you can do, but um, really, I've heard rumors that there are, um, you know, like Zen UML type, uh, Zen UML type systems in, you know, places like uh, China that you can get uh, for the purpose of just making bogus uh, BGP advertisements. Um, 
I highly recommend going to Nanog and talking to, you know, just sort of some of the, the, the profs there because, I mean, they're, um, they tell great stories about getting advertisements like 0000, um, from places like Vietnam and, um, some of it actually working and, yeah, there, there's, I think there's a lot more of this going on than, than even we suspect, right? Um, and not all for spamming. But anyway, uh, that sort of wraps up my talk. What was that like a half an hour? Was I really fast? Excellent. And I'm out of books. So questions, comments, points of clarification? <laughs> oh. Okay. Right. So to paraphrase that, for those who couldn't hear, um, the question is basically, why isn't a regional internet registry able to just basically tell people, hey, um, that origin isn't, sorry? Okay. And there are a couple of those out there. There's actually, like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, why can't we get a third party, how about that, to tell us, um, look, uh, here's all of the prefixes that exist, and here's where their origins should be, right? Um, so why can't we mitigate this with, you know, just sort of a, a list of, right, stuff? Um, and this has actually been tried. Well, there, there's a couple different, like I said, there's the IETF working group that's working on stuff like that. There's also a solution called uh, PGBGP. Wow, I'm amazed I said that right the first time, uh, which is pretty good BGP, right? Um, which is sort of based on um, that sort of thing, right? Like every time somebody gives me an advertisement, I'm going to go to this database and check. Um, the problem is that um, even people who are using these, and, and this was uh, this actually happened uh, March 2005. Um, Google had an outage. Maybe you remember it. Um, and there's a paper out there uh, by a couple guys in Canada um, who looked at origin changes for uh, you know the Google routers while they were having this outage. Google later said that it was a um, DNS outage, as I recall. Uh, but they did find actually that there were some um, origin changes that happened during that period. And on top of that, they found routers that were, um, you know, using things like uh, filters, right? I mean, you would think you could just solve this with, this person is advertising something they're not allowed to, I'll just have that in a filter and it'll be done, right? Um, the problem is what I was explaining to you before about the economy, the, the economics of BGP. Um, you can't assume that even if you're using a filter, uh, that the route is going to come from someone you have filtered. Um, the other thing is, is that you can do things with BGP like AS path prepend, uh, which means that you don't necessarily have to, to, uh, to be the origin anymore. You can just sort of inject yourself into the AS path and that'll work for you, um, for a great number of people. Um, it's, I should back up and say just sort of, um, you know, uh, conceptually, right? Um, we're having the same problem here with spammers that we've always had in the past. And that problem is that we're assuming we can give them some token or credential and we can expect them to not use someone else's, right? Um, and we're also assuming that the protocols involved are robust enough uh, to prevent them from using someone else's. Uh, and the problem really at a conceptual level is that none of that is true, and it never has been. Um, and we really need to rethink, you know, a lot of the underlying protocols, and, you know, a lot of people are doing that. But like I said, a lot of them depend on things like um, uh, PKI and, you know, pipe dreams. Um, anyway, questions, comments, points of clarification? It's a good question, by the way. Yes, in the middle. I, I didn't, didn't quite catch it. Right, yeah, okay, so like RFC 1911 space. Um, 
just unallocated space in general, right. Um, to my knowledge, they aren't. Um, obviously, because this is working, they aren't. Um, I think that, and that's, by the way, totally where I don't want to go, guys, right? Like, that's the whole point that I'm here giving this talk. I don't want to blacklist unallocated IP space, right? I mean, I understand that's the next logical step in the, right, the, and there, as I, there is actually a MAPS RBL that does this. There's a MAPS RBL that your Cisco router can consume that will actually, you know, if it's, you know, not valid IP address space that, um, you, you know, it, as defined by the MAPS RBL, uh, then we won't write, route it, right? And that's just, that scares the crap out of me. Like, I, I don't want to live in that world, and that's so totally why I'm here. Um, but also, um, yeah, I don't think it's logistically feasible at this point um, because, you know, there's sort of a decentralized nature um, to, right, like, this, I'm, one second. So, you, so let's say uh, I'm the, the RIR and I give a whole bunch of unallocated space to, you know, level three. And let's say level three doesn't use it for four years, right? Like, then what do you do? Um, and then you have the problem with that same solution also. What happens when IPv6 gets big and you have spammers that are either, well, what happens until IPv6 gets big and you have spammers hiding behind uh, IPv4, you know, NAT boxes, uh, or after IPv6 gets big and you have spammers hiding behind IPv4, you know, uh, legacy boxes, right? So then what are you going to do? Are you going to say, um, well, if it's coming from the entire IPv6 network, I don't accept their mail. Um, I think there are some really scary places we can go, and I'd, I'd really pr appreciate not going there. So I'm getting the five-minute warning, and I want to give the next speaker um, some time, but I understand I'm being taken to a uh, question-and-answer room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sounded ominous to me. Uh, so I'll meet you guys there if you guys want to come. Oh, wait, which room am I going to? 109.